You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow Podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Buck here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow Podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is serial entrepreneur and founder and CEO of liquidspace.com, Mark Gilbreth. Now, Mark, or Skipper, as his employees and teammates refer to him as, is an experienced entrepreneur and one of the leading voices in the sharing economy technology landscape, supporting his vision of sustainable mobile business practices. Now, in his past, Mark was both a successful real estate developer as well as a software industry veteran with 20 plus years of experience at previous companies, including Wiley, Altera, Toolwire, and Venja Ventures. Now, here's what you're going to learn in our conversation with Mark today. You're going to learn how Mark's prior tech and real estate development endeavors, along with the financial crash of 2008, led to the birth of liquidspace.com, which is an online marketplace for flexible office rental solutions. You'll learn how Mark went about proving his concept prior to rolling it out at scale. You can learn how the COVID crisis is helping to fuel the evolution from the traditional long-term office lease model to a more flexible workplace solution. We're going to talk about Mark's perspective on the future of WeWork and how this and other co-working models are working to adapt themselves to the post-COVID world. Additionally, Mark and I share our own personal war stories of being early trendsetters in the co-working space long before the likes of WeWork came into the picture and much, much more. And so guys, with that, I'm excited to get onto it with Mark here. But before we do, I just have a few quick housekeeping items. First one is we just launched a partnership program with our company called Bring Kevin a Deal. And this is where I will pay you as much as $200,000 for any mobile home park or parking lot opportunity that is referred to me that I end up buying. Now, to learn more about this opportunity of working together and to also download my deal acquisition criteria form, you can go to bringkevinadeal.com. Again, that's bringkevinadeal.com. That's also the same place where you will submit a deal that we can hopefully work together on, okay? Moving on here, if you love what we're doing at the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, please take a moment to subscribe to the show if you haven't done so already. Additionally, if you feel that this content adds value to you and your business uh, and you haven't left a review, please take a moment to leave a review. Um, these reviews really help us attract awesome guests such as Mark to the show. Uh, lastly here, guys, before we get rolling, just want to remind you of the free 30-minute phone call that I offer each and every week. Uh, this is where you can connect with me over the phone where I can basically work with you to discuss your real estate business and talk about anything and everything related to real estate investing, whether you're a beginner just getting started or a seasoned pro. I love meeting others and it's just a way for me to connect and uh, to hopefully give back and act as a sounding board for you. So if you'd like to connect with me uh, on one of these weekly calls, simply go to my website, kevinbup.com and get signed up. There's only two things I ask of you. Number one, Take a moment to write some notes when you're making that appointment about exactly what you'd like to discuss during our 30 minutes together. And then second is, please show up. Uh, if for some reason you can't make that call, please be sure to either reschedule or cancel it ahead of time, okay? Uh, and now, guys, without further ado, let's get on to the part of the show that you've been waiting for, which is our interview with Mark Gilbreth. So here we go. All right, guys, it is my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, founder and CEO of liquidspace.com, Mark Gilbreth. Mark, how are you doing today? Super, Kevin. Great to be with you. Yeah, looking forward to having you here and learning about you and your business. And so just to give our listeners a sense of geography, where are we calling you at today? Uh, today, you are finding me in a ironically rainy Sun Valley, Idaho, which is a little mountain town in the mountains of Idaho. Yeah, good deal. And uh, you gave me some uh, historic lesson before we started here in that uh, Sun Valley, Idaho had the very first chairlift in the world, which is uh, incredibly, uh, that, that caught me off guard. I would never have thought that. So um, and, what, what year was that put in? Is this uh, like 1936, if I'm not okay. mistaken. And, okay. and you shared some knowledge with me as well, which is even as a flatlander, you're an avid skier and you've skied <laughs> most of the 
states in the country that have ski areas, but but that Sun Valley needs to be on your bucket list. Well, with the exception of Idaho, I've I, I literally Idaho is one state I have not even stepped foot in, which is uh, just sad because I feel like I've got a very well versed geographic sense about me, but Idaho has not been on that list yet. So I will I will add it too. <laughs> so again, very excited to have you here, Mark. You're know, looking forward to learning about liquidspace.com. Uh, and so for those folks, let's let's start here. For those folks that aren't familiar with you, uh, your background, kind of the story of how Liquid Space came to be. Maybe take a few minutes and just tell us a little more about yourself and how you found yourself in this world of, of liquidspace.com. Yeah, happy to. I mean, I'm uh, um, Liquid Space was founded and launched nine years ago. Um, and, and maybe just to start briefly on what it is, and then I'll happily sort of tell the, the founding backstory. Um, it's a marketplace for flexible office. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a digital marketplace. You can think of it like an Airbnb, except this is a specialized marketplace that's focused on being a place where individuals and teams and companies can find and book office space and meeting space by the hour or by the day or by the year. Um, and you know, my career has been a series of technology roles. I was an electrical engineer and a computer architect out of college, went straight to Silicon Valley in, in uh, the San Francisco Bay area out of school. Spent about 10 years in the semiconductor world and then got the startup itch and was a co-founder of a software company. And, and then I stumbled into some real estate development, uh, self-storage and office uh, in, in the Boise, Idaho market. And it was actually the sort of collision of my software and technology background and my young and, and somewhat ill-fated foray into real estate development. The collision of those two things <laughs> sort of sent me back to technology, but with an eye on the extraordinary opportunities to bring tech to the commercial office industry. Uh, okay. So, so what was the actual problem or void that you saw in the marketplace that really drove the creation of liquid space? Uh, well, in 2010, if we can all roll back our clocks to reflect on kind of the, the shadow in the wake of the global financial crisis, mm-hmm. which was, of course, you know, predicated largely on, on a, a real estate imbalance, um, you know, in 2008, 2009, 2010, um, you know, we had a we had a recession. We had a substantial pullback in most major markets in the U.S. around office, and it was in that time that I sort of saw in plain view the radical amount of underutilized real estate that was sitting out there in plain view. And you saw it every time you drive down a road in any city because you'd see you know lease listings, you know office office available. Right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, it was that sort of stark in your face view that I couldn't not see in 2010 combined with an experience that I had in 1999 when I was a first time CEO in Silicon Valley with a startup company and had to go lease an office space for my growing team. And I did what you know, every leader in a company does. I, I went and found an office space and was steered down the path of signing at the time a relatively short term lease. It was five years, <laughs> but that was normal. Yeah. And, and lo and behold, my story in 1999, 2000, 2001 was not a lot different than most real estate leaseholders, which is my bet as to how much space I was going to need in five years was completely wrong. In fact, I ended mm-hmm. up taking about 5,000 square feet, two floors of a relatively small building. I never moved into the second floor. So I had that scar tissue from 1999, which was long-term leases are bets <laughs> and, and they're never right. It's either too much or too little. So fast forward to 2009, 2010, when we were working our way out of the global financial crisis and, and recovering from an office recession, and I saw all of this glaring excess inventory in the market. And I also saw the emergence of like mobile apps. And I saw the emergence of Airbnb as a marketplace and the popularity of other marketplaces like Open Table for restaurants and Expedia for hotels. And I thought, wait a minute, we got excess inventory that's sitting underutilized. We've got like a generation of digital marketplace business models that are emerging. No one's done this for office. Imagine if there was a digital marketplace that could connect underutilized real estate with customers that were looking for more flexibility, the very thing that I could have been well served by in 1999 when I signed a long-term lease, even though what I really needed, what would have been ideal for me in 1999 would have been a 12-month agreement or a one or two-year agreement where I had the flexibility to evolve. 
And, yeah. and so that was the problem statement I saw that inspired me to, to create a new tech company. Okay. No, fantastic. I appreciate the, uh, the, the additional insight there. And so, you know, the average consumer, you know, just Joe Schmo that, that owns, you know, XYZ company that, that utilizes office space or just the general consumer that's yeah. driving through the streets of uh, any major city, you know, back in 2010, any city that has office, uh, office uh, space, you know, present. Uh, would have seen the leasing signs, would have seen the vacancies as well. However, the average individual or average consumer would think, well, if it's empty, that means there isn't really an end user for it. Maybe it was overbuilt. There's an oversupply, what have you. And so um, you know, how did you determine that there truly was a need for this type of, of, of a business model or app or marketplace, what have you, in a time such as 2010 where we, we do know that, you know, there obviously was a need for space, but there was also a lot of oversupply, not just in the office sector and uh, the housing space and retail space, what have you. Um, how did you determine the, the actual true need and actually get this off the ground? Yeah. So um, uh, in our pre-chat, I, I mentioned that I had done a little bit of real estate development. So mm -hmm. I started in semiconductors, then software and did some real estate development. And my, the real estate development experience I had was building a small uh, portfolio of self-storage facilities mm -hmm. in the Boise, Idaho market. And for the real estate investors on the call and, and, and even the consumers on, on, on listening in today, everyone knows that the self-storage business model is basically all about flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. you know, it's a month to month agreement and you can have any size space that you want, you know, five by five, 10 by 10, 10 by 20. The principle there is you should never have more or less space than you need. Like if you, you, you buy a bigger locker, if you need it, you can downsize it when you want to. So I was in that business. I was new to real estate, but I was in that business. And I thought, wait a minute, that, that model, if applied to office, makes fundamental sense. Right? So it was that, that framework from a business model standpoint. What if, what if there was the ability to procure just the amount of office space that you needed? and to upsize and or downsize whenever the business conditions warranted that, you know, you know, would that be a better thing? You know, would there be a value prop to that? Would there be an ROI to that? And my thought was, well, from my own personal experience, yeah, when I, when I signed a long-term lease, it, it was invariably a wrong bet. I was oversupplied forever. So I stepped So I built a, a anyway, so I, you know, liquid space came about to try to be, the implementation of that concept, mm -hmm. let's create a digital marketplace where it's solely about office on more flexible terms. Yeah. Let's attract owners that have space to share on flexible terms and people that want it in terms more flexible than a traditional lease. Yeah, no, fan fantastic. And so which market did you uh, go to first to prove this concept? Was this uh, uh, major yeah, cities, launched, San Francisco yeah. or what have you? Yeah, so our, our original thesis was that the uh, most obvious beneficiary of this concept would be a company that was growing rapidly. Because mm -hmm. if I'm growing rapidly, my needs are evolving. I arguably might need more space. Startup companies tend to grow rapidly, but also a lot of startup companies don't end up making it. So there's a high, you know, a high flux in, in terms of what they need. And so Silicon Valley was a very natural place to, to launch this concept. And so liquidspace.com launched nine years ago, um, uh, it, spring nine years ago in San Francisco. And it, it began as a mobile app uh, through which you could search, find, and book meeting rooms or offices by the hour or by the day. That's what began. So it was, it was purely short term mm -hmm. space by the hour, by the day. And the properties that plugged into our platform and had listings were serviced office chains. So think companies like Regis, uh, co-working spaces that were a, a new thing in 2011 and have since blossomed. And to a lesser degree, hotels with their meeting rooms. In all cases, those are, those are space operators, you know, real estate businesses that had meeting rooms and offices that they were ready and able to share on short term basis. That's how it began. And then we pretty quickly uh, expanded it across the U.S. and, and, and beyond that uh, into additional international markets. Did you find any barriers with the traditional office owners that are used, were used to those five, seven, 10 year, you know, long term leases? Did you find a barrier to get, getting them on board? Those that had that vacant space that were waiting for that end user to come in, that was going to take a minimum of a five year lease, which isn't a good fit for a lot of people, as we just discussed. Um, and, you know, how'd you overcome that, that barrier? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the real estate industry um, has a lot of 
strong, established sort of legacy players. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of folks, a lot of constituents that really don't want the model to change. The brokerage community, you know, likes the industry as it is. The legal community likes the industry as it is. And of course, the, the developers and property owners have had a long and very positive run. Um, at the outset, we didn't try to attract or work with property owners directly because we started in a portion of the office market that was completely neglected. That portion being, you know, Kevin and Mark want a meeting room for an hour tomorrow at two o'clock. Uh, Kevin needs an office next Thursday for an offsite with his 10 colleagues. Gotcha. Uh, Mark needs a space at, near the Tampa airport for an afternoon of work before he flies home. Landlords weren't set up to, nor were they interested, nor are they interested even today in supporting that by the hour, by the day type activity. Mm-hmm. So we, we began there. We began there to prove out the concept of a digital marketplace where you could search, find, book, and pay in one complete flow online. Right? Mm-hmm. So we, we started at that short end of the market, if you will. Now, about four years ago, we expanded liquid space to accommodate longer term transactions. Um, Mark and Kevin want a two-person office for a month. Uh, Oracle wants a 30-person office for two years. Uh, so we moved into transactions where the billable unit might be a month at a time and where a, a term transaction could be multiple years. And with that, we started to work directly with landlords. I can show you more about that. Got it. Got it. Yeah, no, no, no it's, it's a very interesting model, especially the, the evolution of it. There was even a, a part of your website that I saw, maybe it was, it was alt space. I think, mm-hmm. you, correct me if I'm wrong, where you even go as far as offering a you know, fully built out office, right? I mean, literally with all the furnishings, what have you, um, design furnishings, literally ready to move in turnkey. And so let's just talk, let's talk about the evolution of, you know, from where it started, which we've kind of covered, but, you know, what are the, the you know the full suite of offerings that Liquid Space uh, you know, provides to the market today? Yeah, so um, uh, broadly speaking, um, our platform LiquidSpace.com is about finding and evaluating and confidently transacting space, physical space. Yep. Um, and there are two sort of large buckets of, of use cases, if you will. There's what we internally refer to as on demand. And that is a situation where I need a space for the duration of a task. It might be two attorneys doing a deposition. It might be you and I taping this interview. It might be a marketing team doing an offsite. It could be a salesperson meeting with a client. But the duration of that requirement is the duration of a task. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of work. We call that on demand. And so the customers of that activity are salespeople on the go, attorneys, and the growing numbers of employees that are working from home much of the time, but occasionally need something to augment home. So that's on demand. The other sort of bucket of use case is what we refer to as dedicated space. And this is where you know Kevin wants an individual office for a month or six months or a year or two, or a team of employees want to have a dedicated office for you know months or several years, but still shorter than a traditional lease. Um, and so uh, at, the, at the core level, Liquid Space is about enabling people to find and transact space online with a click for those two buckets, on-demand and dedicated. In Got addition, yeah. the one yeah. further uh, service offering that we developed that you referenced is something we call Alt Space. Mm-hmm. And that is about uh, enabling the inclusion of design and furnishing and fit out and technology along with the space. So in particular, if you're a landlord, an institutional building owner or a small local building owner, and you've got uh, a spec suite or a a warm shell or even a second generation space that's now vacant, it's unfurnished, um, but you're interested in making that available to the growing demand in the market where the customer might want a move-in ready space, the alt space service allows your physical real estate to be bundled with all of the furnishing and all of the technology that can make that a move and ready space. Hmm. Uh, and we partnered with Steelcase, the furniture company, to create a streamlined and systematic way that we can package and bundle furniture and technology along with physical space from building owners. Got it. Very, very cool. So I'd love to, if we could, Mark, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and pivot over to what you referenced as the white elephant in the room right before we started the interview. And we find ourselves in some 
some crazy times at present. You know, the not just this country, but the entire world is in somewhat of a tailspin, some at a different stage of that tailspin than others. You know, one of the big changes that's occurred is people aren't working out of their offices today. Lots of companies haven't fully gone back to work. In fact, the majority have it. There might be, you know, bits and pieces of their workforce that are working out of the office, but the majority still working from home. There's been a, uh, and I don't want to call it a mass exodus because I think that the media overhypes uh, a lot of these things. However, there are folks that are moving out of, you know, the, the more densely populated cities, uh, more specifically the ones that, you know, New York, Chicago, um, that, that were, yeah, San Francisco, that were in more of a lockdown stage for a longer period that had the greater impacts of, of this coronavirus. Moving to maybe mountain towns or suburbia, what have you, but just basically getting somewhere they actually have some open space. And whether it be permanent or temporary, who knows yet, right? Again, we're kind of in the middle of this thing. No one knows what, you know, I hate the new normal. I hate using that terminology, but no one knows what the new normal really looks like. We're still in the uh, volatile stages of it. You know, there's even certain cities that are still, you know, in like the, you know, maybe only the first phase of reopening, right? So they're pretty much still in lockdown. And um, yeah. gosh, now the lot, most of the countries, uh, other countries in the U.S., including even like now we're down here in Florida, even the Caribbean and all that, like they're not allowing folks from the U.S. in, right? I mean, we're pretty much, we're stuck here in the U.S. We're not going anywhere at this point in time. And so uh, the question I have is, um, and, and it relates to, you know, just really co-working first because co-working ties in with, you know, the office model ties in with liquid space, what have you. Do you feel that this pandemic could be the end of the WeWork or the co-working model in general? Um, no, absolutely not, <laughs> actually. Um, and, and just and, and for the listeners, just a point of clarification. Um, if you go to liquidspace.com today to our marketplace, in our platform, you will find we work and Regis mm-hmm. and Industrious and Convene and the thousands of other co-working space and serviced office operators, as well as landlords, as well as private companies subletting excess space. And so those those firms that you mentioned, like Regis and WeWork, are our partners. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we are a platform that allows people to find them and transact them. Now, to your question directly, like is is COVID and all that it has wrought going to be the end of co-working? Um, I think absolutely not. Um, to your point, I think you're spot on. We can't know, and it'd be dangerous to, to be too boldly predicted, predictive about what the new normal is going to be. Yeah. That said, um, there are some broad outlines that um, are pretty clear now. And um, there are some fairly grounded predictions of what the new normal will have as some of its characteristics that I'm certainly prepared to share. So here's, here's kind of our take on what we've learned so far over the last three and a half, four months. Mm-hmm. Number one, um, fact, there was what I think history will refer to as a great workplace migration that happened in March for, for most cities. Right? Everybody was, was forced to leave the office. Now, they were forced to leave the office because cities were shut down. In addition, they were given permission by their employers to go work from home in the interest of their own safety uh, because of the threat of infection. So we had this mass exodus uh, and something quite interesting began to demonstrate itself in the, in the weeks that followed. It wasn't even a month later that James Gorman, the CEO of Morgan Stanley on Bloomberg TV said, over 90% of our employees are working at home. This is, this is a bank, this is a conservative investment bank. Over 90% of our employees are working at home. We've had no major issues. Quote, clearly, we will need much less real estate. Like this was six weeks into COVID. And a conservative company was already declaring what fundamentally amounts to a transformation in how they think about real estate. Mm-hmm. Now, now, since that time, uh, those accelerated learnings have been experienced by a great many companies. Facebook, Spotify, Okta, USAA, Nationwide Insurance, Shopify, and an ongoing list of companies have come out and said such things as, Kevin, you're going to have permission to work from home as long as you want to. We'll have an office for you here if you want to come back, but we're going to give you the permission to choose when you want to work from home and when you want to work somewhere else. Mm-hmm. All right. So one, one fact that I'm ready to assert as to, to part of what new normal might look like is, Home is going to be a part of workplace. Mm-hmm. Workplace will evermore be a distributed phenomena. We used to talk about it as headquarters. Companies lease space. 
fit it out in an elegant way, cook lunches for their employees, expect people to come there. That was, that was the center of workplace and corporate identity. Today, um, it's a distributed workplace. It begins at home every morning. Some employees might be happy staying there all of the time. In fact, Gensler just published an exhaustive survey that they did of over 300 companies, and their data revealed that 56% of surveyed employees want to spend at least one day a week working at home. Um, so home will be a part of the workplace, but not only. It's not a home versus office. It will be a part of workplace yeah. for many companies. HQ and dedicated office will, of course, be as well, but flexible office in the middle, of which co-working and serviced offices and landlord spec suites, spec suites are a part, is absolutely going to be in the mix now. So our worldview is that workplace is going to be home plus flex plus traditional, and employees will be distributed across that spectrum. Um, and that's a radical shift from where we were just in January. Yeah. I think there's probably a large sector. I'm sure there's probably been some surveys done. I don't know what the statistics look like of, of folks that, while they might suggest that they're going to continue to work, given the choice, work a day a week or two days a week from home, they also, they miss that social interaction, that social en engagement, right? The camaraderie that comes along with actually being in an office environment. I'm one of those folks, right? I, I, I enjoy being around others, right? I, I thrive off the energy. And it's really challenging to get that in most home environments. Now, I, I really enjoy my home office, don't get me wrong, um, but it becomes especially difficult for those folks that might live in more uh, urban core environments with smaller housing. You know, they don't really have the dedicated office. They're working on their couch. They're working in their kitchen. They might have children running around, what have you. Um, yep. A whole nother slew of challenge that, challenges that get thrown into the mix. And so the follow-up question would be, what changes do you think need to occur to the co-working model uh, in order for it to adjust then uh, to this new world? Because I, I think, I mean, part of it's going to be folks getting comfortable again, right? Uh, getting comfortable with, you know, being in close quarters, getting comfortable, um, you know, traveling to and from an office location, being around other individuals, what have you. Yeah. But what are some of the, you know, maybe it's not specific to liquid space, what have you, just what's the talk like within the industry as a whole of, what are the changes that are going to need to occur in order to adapt to make folks comfortable here in the future? Yeah. So, um, you know, beginning in early March, the safe place to work was home and yeah. we all retreated to home. Right. Um, and, you know, in some markets, as soon as late April, people began to venture out. Right. And the first order, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the first order priority uh, was health and safety. Right. And so, whether I was, whether me leaving home was to go back to my company's office or whether it was to work maybe somewhere close to home at a co-working space or a serviced office, in either of those scenarios, health and safety was and remains the number one priority. Mm -hmm. So within that realm, in the co-working world in particular, I've had the privilege of being on the advisory committee for an industry consortium uh, called the Workplace Council, which has developed a, a playbook for co-working and serviced office operators to ready their environments, to have a health and safety playbook. And in fact, in, on liquidspace.com, we've added badges to our property partners who have implemented health and safety protocols. Mm -hmm. And the types of things that we're seeing implemented are, are perhaps straightforward. It's heightened cleaning protocols. It's moving toward more spacing and lower density within those environments. Um, in many cases, it's... Um, reformatting the interior environments to be more about private spaces rather than the communal shared environments that some co-working spaces had as their primary design format. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as you can imagine, I'm, you know, here today in July, I'm going to be less comfortable walking into a crowded, dense environment where 50 other individuals from 50 other companies are all mingling around. That's not going to feel safe. I'm not going to choose to do that. On the flip side, the ability to have a space that's private, a controlled room, maybe for me and you to meet or for me to do an individual day's work that's near home where I don't have to get on mass transit, that could actually be very appealing, especially on those days when my home environment doesn't work for work. Maybe my spouse is home on Fridays and I need, to, I need a place to work, or maybe the kids are home from summer school on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or maybe two days a week, as you described, Kevin, and I relate to it, maybe a, maybe a couple days a week, I need to collaborate with other colleagues and team members, mm -hmm. either because it's a piece of work that I need their interaction with or 
because I need that social interaction myself to feel yeah. productive. Yeah. It would be a sad day to see co-working, the model of co-working go away or be eliminated or be changed for the worse. And so I, I, I'll tell you a little secret, share some uh, a secret with you that I didn't tell you before we got on the, the show here is I actually, I, I had done a lot of a travel a bunch and back in the, uh, you know, 2008, 9, 10 timeframe, I was introduced to co-working uh, throughout my, mostly the travels out West. It seemed like it kind of like everything does. It starts out West and migrates its way to the East coast, right? Uh, all yeah. the, you know, the popular trends, what have you. And I was just uh, amazed at the different co-working spaces I went to. So it became actually a, a little favorite, you know, event of mine. Every time I would travel, I would go try to seek out a co-working space to work in for a day or two, even if I didn't have to, right? I just really yeah. enjoyed actually going to see the different models. Yeah. I, in turn, purchased a uh, an office property. This is 2000, mid-2010 now, back in Clearwater here, Clearwater, Florida. It was a distressed office property. Had way more space than what I needed for my very own business and ultimately wanted to bring the first co-working model to the Tampa Bay area. However, I think I was a little early to the trend here, at least in the, the, the Tampa Bay, the Florida market. I was the only one for a radius of about 120 miles, and uh, it was very much an educational session. And so anyway, uh, that did not last long. It was okay. I, I ultimately ended up leasing that space out to you know another operator that took the entirety of the, the remaining space. And my co-working dreams died, at least from me owning a co-working space. But I love the model. I love the concept of it. And um, again, You're an OG. It, yeah, it'd, it'd be a sad day to see it ever go away or change. And in fact, I mean, it's, and I don't even want to call it a disruptor. I mean, it's just, it's really the evolution of the, of the office space and especially for the entrepreneurs, right? The smaller companies, the, the you know, solopreneurs or the two, three, four team members, what have you that want to get into a collective space, share that energy, uh, you know, of their, their fellow colleagues, what have you. And don't necessarily need a big office space. Might have a home, you know, office to work from a couple of days a week. And uh, anyway, not to drone on here, but I wanted to circle back on the discussion of of WeWork. Adam Newman, the founder, obviously it's a kind of a crash and burn theory. And this isn't a, you know, this isn't a pounce on WeWork. I just, I would love your honest opinion as to knowing that you understand the co-working space. Adam Newman, the founder, he lost millions of dollars on a failed IPO. I don't know that what the amount was, and was ultimately booted off the board, what have you. But, you know, I think we can all agree that he's an absolute brilliant businessman and a visionary, right? I mean, he did something to a scale that no one else had done in the co-working space. In your honest opinion, you know, where do you think things went wrong? Where do you think Adam went wrong? And, and what would you have done differently, you know, if you were in his shoes? I'll reserve judgment on what Adam personally did right or wrong. I'll, uh, but I'll let, let me expand on yeah. what I think WeWork got right um, and, and what they leveraged and even exploited. And then, uh, and then the aspects of it that I cross my fingers will sort of prevail and, and carry forward. Because I think mm-hmm. that they're under much stronger or on much stronger footing now than they were. So yeah. um, what we have to recognize is that, um, that WeWork was fueled by an unnatural amount of capital. Yeah. And, un, and, you know, and an unnatural amount. Um, if they aren't the most highly capitalized startup company ever, they're certainly in the top five or top 10. Mm-hmm. So, you know, $10 billion of soft bank capital was put behind um, an exciting vision. And, the, you know, the core of the vision and the core of the proposition was around flexibility. Now, I mean, that, that is what you were delivering in Tampa and, and, in you know 2010, um, that's what every co-working space and serviced office from a business model is is sort of doing. That's different than a traditional lease. You're allowing that customer, whether it's a big enterprise or a small startup company or an individual, to have the ability to say, you know what, I might want to buy space for an hour or for a month. I don't know what next month is going to bring. I, I want that flexibility. And we work wrapped around that. And this is where it got into a bit more showmanship. They wrapped around that. Um, sort of a, a, a mystical narrative of community, uh, an almost cult-like enthusiasm in a, in a, in a, in a, around the power of that community. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where they got over their skis to a degree. Um, the fundamental business that they're in today that they've retrenched to, and I think will be very successful with, is um, providing space on flexible terms. 
you know, well-designed, well-furnished, well-located, well-operated space on flexible terms. Like they're, they're, you know, they're the Marriott or a Marriott of, of office fundamentally. And um, at a time, I mean, when they started in 2010, and even more so today, flexibility is on the rise. Like let's, let's set aside COVID for a moment. Mm-hmm. A flexible office economy, of which WeWork was a part, and thousands of others are there, has had an extraordinary 10 years. Even with WeWork's spectacular kind of retrenchment, mm-hmm. the market overall has grown over 40% year over year, right? So it's, it's gone from being less than 1% of office sort of allocation to three or four or five percent in many markets and most projections pre-COVID were citing that it was going to be 20 to 30 percent within the next 10 years because not because people are hungry for community but because more and more companies want flexibility for more and more of their office allocation now throw COVID into the mix what does that do how does that change the forecast well the, the the biggest thing that COVID is doing to the economy right now is injecting uncertainty like companies don't know what the outlook's going to be. We know that our economy has taken a grievous hit. It's hard to forecast what the business outlook is going to be. Mm-hmm. On top of that, every CFO at every public company is looking at the fact that their offices are now underutilized and they're seeing and hearing the stories of their employees, some of whom are working okay at home, and they're recognizing that now is a moment to recalibrate. Now is a moment to downsize on that fixed footprint and and make savings and then be in a position to facilitate and provide for workplace in a more on-demand capacity from places like WeWork and others to accommodate those employees that need something between home and the traditional office. So I firmly believe, and I think most of my peers in the co-working and flexible office industry see the same thing, that that COVID is going to be a substantial tailwind for flexible office of which mm-hmm. co-working is a certain flavor. Yeah, no, the, the very interesting perspective. And I mean, would you go as far as saying that of these various companies that are now quickly realizing that their conventional office space is being underutilized while they might be still stuck in a remainder of three, four, five, potentially even longer years worth of a, of a lease, that might represent an opportunity for liquid space, right? I mean, you, helping them better utilize yeah. that space that is no longer being used by, you know, a portion of their workforce. Yeah. So, I mean, liquid space like Airbnb is a two-sided business model. There's demand and there's supply. Mm-hmm. Uh, the demand side is everything from individuals to big enterprises that need space on the supply side. Um, it could be a WeWork. work. It is a WeWork work in a hotel and an industrious and a convene and a Regis, but it's also thousands of companies that have more space on traditional leases than they need. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if Kevin's got two extra desks in his sound studio that he wants to monetize by the month, <laughs> he can list it on liquid space. Um, if AT&T has an extra building that they have three more years of lease on and that they're not going to use anymore, they can list it on liquid space. So, you know, companies can actually be users on both sides of the marketplace. They can monetize excess space and they can procure space where they need it on flexible terms. Yeah, fantastic. I love every bit of it. Are, are there any other important items that we might have missed, uh, you know, as it relates to liquid space and, and the services your company provides? Um, I think the key message to the well, first of all, address kind of let me let me let me share a key message for companies yeah. and then on the on the demand side, if you will, mm-hmm. and then similarly for for building owners on the supply side. To companies, I think. Um, most companies spent March and April and into May just triaging, figuring out, you know, the policies and the protocols to make their employees productive at home. Like, let's get them set up on Zoom. Let's get them firewalls. Mm-hmm. Let's get them notebook computers if they need it. That was triage. Let's then triage our corporate offices to be ready to let them come back and be safe. So let's figure out how many people we can let back in. Let's figure out where we're going to put the hand wash stations and, and how we're going to get people up and down the elevators safely. They've been triaging all of that. Um, now they have the time and the space and the need to start to figure out, okay, we're going to be downsizing our corporate offices over time because we're, it's now clear we're not going to need as much of that. How do we start to provide additional space to augment home? How do we provide on-demand space for employees when, on days when they need something else? 
How do we provide uh, dedicated team space for groups that want to work close together but don't want to come to the headquarters? And so I guess the message to companies is um, this isn't theoretical. <laughs> there, there are thousands of spaces out there. You can find them all on a platform. It's called Liquid Space. Like you can deploy an on-demand distributed workplace tomorrow. It's ready to roll. So that's that's the hopefully the welcome news to, to companies that are saying, you know, Holy heck, what, what am I going to do to help that employee who's trapped at home that wants something near home? So that's mm -hmm. that message. On the, demand, on the supply side, I'd like to sort of call out building owners in particular. Mm -hmm. Most building owners, um, you're an exception. Most building owners were not as progressive as you were, Kevin, in 2010. They're, they're accustomed to signing long-term leases. Like for them, they're, they're great at site development, location, built, you know, hiring brokers, but they're used to tenants that sign long-term leases. They're not used to serving customers on flexible terms. For building owners, the message is there is a rapidly growing demand for space on more flexible terms. If you want to participate in that economy, you need to ready yourself to be able to efficiently do transactions on flexible terms. That means you're not going to be trading a 90 page lease agreement back and forth and redlining it. That's not the way the flexible office economy works. You're going to want a simple standard of agreement. It also means that your inventory needs to show up online because that's where people are searching. Uh, and so the message to landlords is um, there's a platform and a tool set that can let you be active in the flexible office economy tomorrow. Yeah, you know, Fantastic. I've got one follow-up question to that. Is there a, a service that liquid space provides for building owners, for landlords that, for example, I'm looking here where I, where I live. My, the actual address that I live is Palm Harbor, Florida. So it's just north of Clearwater. And there, there's a few right. options in Palm Harbor, not nearly as many options as, as there are in Tampa, right? Tampa is much more of a major city. For those that might have space available or a building available that, that could have flexible space to see what type of demand before listing it, before going through that process, um, determining through liquid space, how many folks are actually searching for you know, specific types of space in that given area. Yeah. Is, that, is that a service you offer? It's a fantastic question. And it, yes, it is. In fact, it's built into our platform. So if Kevin owns a building in Palm Harbor, Florida, he can create a listing on liquid space. And when he does, as a privilege of having a listing, being part of the supply base, you will immediately start to see what we call demand signals. You'll see people searching in that market. Mm -hmm. In fact, our platform also, so, so if somebody comes into liquid space and searches in Tampa or in searches in Palm Harbor, you'll have visibility to what they are looking for. And the platform also gives you tools to be able to send a proposal to that person that's searching. So customer might be poking around for a 10 person office in Tampa. You can actually reach out to them anonymously through the platform in a secure way and say, Hey, I see you're looking in Tampa for a 10 person office. I've actually got a 10 person office here in Palm Harbor. Would you like to take a look? Here's a link to my profile. So got it. Enabling owners to see what the market wants is a powerful concept. Uh, yeah. We're also working on data analytics to start to provide proactive guidance to developers so that they can contemplate what inventory should I build and where, mm -hmm. right? And how That's should I price it? That's where I was really going with that question. I like that. <laughs> what is the yeah? What does the market want? Yes. What should I build? Yes. Uh, what you know? Is it ten person offices or twenty person offices or one person offices? What's what's the price that the market will bear? How strong is that demand signal? Yeah, yeah. Well, even not even necessarily build, but as we move into these these ever changing times, I, I do think there's going to be a lag in traditional office space, right? But as some of these leases come up for renewal, these you know yeah. these longer term leases the old landlords that haven't adapted to a new model are going to suffer, you know, and some will ultimately you know, end up losing their property. And so just from a investor's perspective, finding out, you know, where the opportunities are is one thing, but what is the demand for that opportunity, right? Who is the end user that's going to yeah. occupy or need that space and, and marrying the two together? So this is a little bit speculative, but one of the macro trends that's starting to present itself is that, there is some dislocation of employees. There is some evidence growing, especially in the capital markets, that Sunbelt, low-tax, pro-business communities mm -hmm. um, are attracting relocations of employees. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, if you look at the capital markets for public office REITs, 
you know, REITs in New York City are down, I think, 40%. Uh, but in, in Sunbelt pro business, low tax markets, um, they're holding pretty steady. And so mm-hmm. that's the capital markets anticipating that, yep. that people that have choice now in terms of where they want to live. Facebook, for example, has told their employees, would you like to move? And over 50% said, yes, we'd like to live somewhere else other than the Bay Area. So there's already, there's already a liberation that's starting to happen. I think the, the execution of this is going to be, you know, <laughs> you know, months and years. Yeah. But you know, if you're, if you're playing the long game, um, I think some of the signals are already starting to present itself in terms of where you might choose to develop or yeah, where, yeah. where long development plays might yield. Fun conversation, Mark. This is, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you here and learn about your business. So you, you've got something very special there and uh, wishing you all the best as we roll through these uncharted waters. So, you know, for those folks that want to learn more about, you and the services that your team offers, I'm assuming uh, the best place to learn about that is just by going to liquidspace.com. Is that correct? That is correct. And I'm also happy to share my contact info, um, Mark with a K, Mark mm-hmm. at liquidspace.com. Okay, fantastic. Well, Mark, thank you for joining us here today and, and best wishes to you and the company. And uh, uh, again, everything that you have going on there. Uh, great pleasure, Kevin. And, and uh, I'm certainly thrilled to hear that you were one of the original gangsters in co-working. <laughs> so you should wear that label with pride. Oh, gee. I just let the domain actually expire like six months ago. And I, it was called the Cowork Lab, the coworklab.com. I'm like, that was a really good domain. I, I'm not sure. I think a co-working space actually purchased the domain, but I kept it for many, many years thereafter because I thought it was a great name, but didn't really have the interest of actually getting back into the co-working space from a development perspective. But no, I love, I love the niche. Uh, you know, I love the, the evolution of the office space and the flexibility of co-working. And uh, just to give you some additional insight of we actually chose. So it timed out really well with the, with the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Our office mm-hmm. space was coming up for renewal. Our, our traditional office space was coming up for renewal in yeah. March, at the end of March. And we, cho- we decided at the beginning of the year, that we were going to go remote and uh, just, you know, we found ourselves, you know, working through Slack in the office and not talking sometimes, you know, throughout yeah. the day with the other employees there. And what yeah. was the point of actually spending $5,000 a month on a traditional office space? However, there were a few employees that given their, you know, their choice, they would have still left their home and worked at an office. And so we gave them the flexibility to actually, yeah. you know, get a membership at a local co-working space in the same little town that we had our office in. And, uh, and a couple chose to do that. And, you know, the remainder did not. And so it would very much aligns with what we're talking about here today and then how I think the future will, will ultimately play out with the changes of employers and util- utilization of their space and what have you. So uh, very exciting time. So again, Mark, pleasure having you. Thank you for joining me. And guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Buck, wishing you huge success and take care. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. And we'll see you next Monday morning.